everyone. My name is Becca Choate, and I serve as Associate for Global Advocacy and Education with Global Ministries of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ. Welcome to today's webinar, The Middle East in Transition and the Future and Role of its Christians. Uh, it's part of our, the UCC's Wednesdays with the World webinar series, and this series highlights the ways in which the quest for justice is intersectional and global, providing opportunities for increased awareness of global concerns and highlighting opportunities for advocacy and action. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Peter McCary, who serves as the executive for the Middle East and Europe with Global Ministries, and will be moderating today's conversation. Peter. Thank you very much, Becca, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us uh, today on this special opportunity uh, to engage with one of our partners uh, and the General Secretary of the Middle East Council of Churches, Dr. Michelle Hobbs. Uh, we are delighted to host uh, this webinar on the UCC platform through Global Ministries of the UCC and Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, this webinar is a collaborative effort uh, and is, is sponsored together with the Middle East mission offices of uh, several churches and agencies, including the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, Church World Service, the Episcopal Church USA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Presbyterian Church USA, the Reformed Church in America, the United Methodist Church, and the United Church of Canada. So we welcome all of you, uh, no matter your membership and are grateful for your participation today. Uh, this webinar uh, comes at a very timely opportunity. Uh, as, you, as we have all experienced this past year has been uh, the year of the COVID pandemic, uh, but it is also a time that we mark 10 years uh, since the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring. And in that time, we have watched political transition in Egypt. Uh, we still observe the reality of 10 years of conflict and strife in Syria. In addition, we also recognize 18 years since the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. And just this past weekend, we remember Nakba Day uh, for the Palestinians of 73 years ago. We are also mindful of the financial and economic and political crisis that Lebanon is passing through. So in this particular time, uh, we are grateful uh, for the, the opportunity uh, to hear from Dr. Abs uh, and his uh, presentation of the issues in the region and the role of Christians in it. Uh, we also are at a time of, uh, of religious um, holidays at the time following Ramadan, Eid al-Adha is, uh, is, uh, is just happening. And also Eastern churches have celebrated Easter just earlier this month. So we are in a time of Easter and the remembrance of the resurrection uh, and as we anticipate Pentecost. So it is indeed uh, an opportunity uh, to reflect, particularly from the region uh, where Christ uh, was born and ministered. At this time, before I introduce Dr. Abs, I would like to offer an opportunity for the Reverend Canon Robert Edmonds, who is the Middle East Partnership Officer of the Episcopal Church in the US, uh, to offer a word of prayer as we open our session. Bob? I think Bob would need to unmute. Hey, there we go. Hi, Peter. thank you, Peter. Uh, it's a great joy to be with all of you and a great privilege to offer a prayer on, on behalf of this uh, gathering. And, uh, and here we go. The Lord be with you. And also with Heavenly you. Father, even in this time of grief and sadness at the loss of life and destruction of property and portions of your holy land, we offer thanks to you for this time together, for the ministry of the Middle East Council of Churches, for the witness of faithful Christians throughout the Middle East and around the world to your healing and transformational presence. We ask your blessing upon all who work for peace, for justice, 
for reconciliation and for renewal. For we ask your blessing upon our time together today, that we may gain deeper understanding, mutual encouragement, and faithful courage for the times in which we live through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. So the, uh, the, the ecumenical partners that I mentioned earlier, including the UCC and disciples, have long relationships with the Middle East Council of Churches as partners and friends. The Middle East Council of Churches is a body of 20, representing 27 uh, member communions uh, from two strands of the Orthodox, of the Orthodox traditions, as well as the Catholic churches and the Protestant churches in the region spanning eight countries and more than 15 million Christians. Dr. Obbs was elected General Secretary last September uh, by the Executive Committee of the MECC. Uh, the General Assembly of the MECC was postponed due to the COVID uh, pandemic. And Dr. Obbs is an economist and a sociologist. He holds a bachelor's degree and master's degree and higher diplomas in both fields and a PhD in sociology with a focus on economic behavior. He began lecturing at the university level very early and already has a 42 year uh, experience in this field accompanied by approximately as many years of experience in management and consultancy in business, education and development. When he was elected general secretary of the MECC, he was fulfilling the role of its treasurer, in addition to lecturing and advising for doctoral theses at San Joseph University in Beirut, where he is a member of the Research Ethics Committee. His research interests cover the areas of Christian presence in the Middle East, as well as socioeconomic and sociocultural developments, in which he wrote and supervised a series of articles and research papers. Dr. Abs is also a social activist, dealing with interreligious and interethnic dialogue, social justice and sociocultural development, promoting the culture of dialogue, openness, and justice. He is a member and participant in the establishment of several social action groups, including syndicates and NGOs. We are delighted to welcome you, Dr. Abs, and look forward to hearing your perspectives on the issues facing uh, the countries of the region, as well as the Christian communities and churches. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCarty. Thank you for having uh, me with you, for giving me this opportunity today to talk to this uh, honorable and concerned group of yours. Uh, well, I, I'll start by sharing. That's it. And while he shares his screen, just to, just to uh, let you know that if you have questions, please enter them in the question and answer box as opposed to the chat. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So my intervention, as uh, we decided to be, is about the Middle East and transition and the role of Christians. Why the role of Christians? Because, because the, the Christians are in a shaky situation and they uh, have some concerns about their faith and their future. I'll be presenting the, the, the dynamics of the area which led to the actual situation and I'll be focusing later on, on Christians on the actual situation and then the future perspective of Christian presence. I'm trying, okay, one moment. Okay, uh, it worked. Okay, so it's a historical background of what the Middle East lives today. Why do we have such a Middle East? I start with, it. I go very quickly on the concept and on the facts. The Ottoman millet system. The Ottoman millet system was applied to, to non-Christians, to non-Christian, to, to non-Muslims, I'm sorry, to, to Christians and Jews by the Ottoman Empire. And each, each milli assumed responsibility for social administrative functions not provided by the states. So ever since that time, they put the cornerstone of what we live today in Lebanon, which is the political confessionalism and what is now Syria and Iraq living. So uh, the groups who were under this, this rule were the Greek Orthodox, the Armenians, the Syriacs too, and the Assyrians and so on. 
They survived through a generalized system of imperial toleration and intense negotiation. Every now and then there was problems and there was a review of the whole agreement with the government with the with loss of persecution, which, which may precede any negotiation. The Middle system, this is a definition. I mean, those who receive the slides will be able to read it. It's, it's the Middle system too. The Middle system has the Middle Hakimi, the Middle, the dominant Middle, and the uh, and the dominated Middle. The dominant Middle is the all the Muslims, mainly the Sunnis, and the the dominated Middle are the non-Muslims, mainly Christians, and Jews, and sometimes the Yazidis and other subgroups. This is also a definition. It was headed by the religious dignitary of the of the group. It means that it was a sort of a psychological religious government living alone within this big entity, which was the Ottoman Empire. Balfour Declaration, you know what Balfour did? He declared, he promised the land of Palestine to the Jews saying that the government of the England, the British government was not against creating a, a Jewish state in Palestine. So this shows this shows the beginning of how this area on this nation was never able to control its destiny or to control its fate. The Versailles Treaty of 1919, Britain was entrusted the administration of Palestine because it was supposed to create the state of Israel. Sykes-Picot Agreement, they created the modern Middle East. They made impossible and unrealistic promises to Arabs and we know about uh, Lawrence uh, of Arabia. Uh, it was a secret deliberation, which means it was a conspiracy against the Arab world, against the Arab Middle East, the Levant. And it was made of official in San Remo Conference 1920. Yeah, and it means four years after it was done. These are the Monsieur uh, Picot and Sykes. This is the map of the how the region was divided. Whereas it is one nation, it's one people, fully one people, although it has some re religious divisions, but in the deep down, we have the same culture, the same social structure, the same mentality, whatever is our religion. They divided it in a models that sometimes are comic. This is a comic way of dividing an area. They're just playing on paper. You know, you know when they divided Lebanon from Syria, we had a house in the borderline between Lebanon and Syria, which kitchen is in Syria? I mean, now it's a, a, a caricature in one uh, British American American newspaper, uh, Sykes Picot uh, sitting and dividing the area and inviting the Americans to join the um, the lunch. The Treaty of Sèvres, Treaty of Sèvres between the Allies too. They they divided the Ottoman uh, Empire, the, the land of the Ottoman Empire, and put it under their supervision. You know, everybody knows about it, but I want just to underline it. The San Remo Conference, it was in San Remo that they confirmed that they, that they um, asked uh, Britain to, to govern Palestine in favor of the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. But they said that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, and they expelled hundreds of thousands of people, and political status enjoyed by Jews. They destroyed the houses, they destroyed the, the presence of the Arab Jews who were living in a very normal situation all, all through the Arab world. This is the uh, Sarimo. King Ukraine Commission was sent by the President, the American President Woodrow Wilson, Woodward Wilson, and uh, during the peace, Paris, Paris Peace Conference of 1990 to determine the attitudes of the inhabitants of Syria and Palestine, they they solicited petitions from the people. The Arab favored an independent Syria, free of any French mandate, and of the 1,000. 875 petitions, 72% were hostile to the Zionist plan for a Jewish national home in Palestine. This is a sample of the petitions uh, from the Aleppo area. And this is the King Crane published in a, in a, in a newspaper. 
And the sentence below, the picture where people in the Middle East were getting bread, were having a rush over the bread. Secret diplomacy one, now it's collecting and the Near East Indians are pleading for bread. So we all know what's the key of domination. Syria, it was divided in Middle States. This is the area. The, the, the red line is the Sever Convention, 1920. And the, Lausanne, the, the blue line is the Lausanne Convention, 1923. This area between the two lines is an area full of Christians. At your left hand, you have Armenians, Arab Orthodox, Catholics, Arab Catholics. You have Syriacs and you have Assyrians. All this area was divided and given to Turkey. The French claimed they, they couldn't keep it for them. I had a fight once in a discussion with a, with a official of the French um, embassy in Beirut. And they, they're aware that they did a mistake. They couldn't keep it because this area is not Turkish. Now Turkey is using it to attack Syria and destroy Northern Syria. And then during the French mandate, they divided Syria into five states, five states, Damascus for Sunni, Aleppo for Christians, uh, the Alawite Mountain, the Jabal Druze for the Druze, the autonomous Sanjak of Alexandretta, where Antioch, the, the, the capital of Christianity, resides, and Greater Lebanon. So they were playing games with minorities, and they were applying the sort of middle system, but in a geographic way. Iskandarun, the loss of Alexandretta, which is Iskandarun in Arabic, and Antioch. This is the area which was lost between, between the Sevres and the Lausanne lines. This is Skandarun. This is Antakya, which is Antioch, the capital of Christianity, where Christians were the first time named Christians. Where, they, where, where the apostle embarked from, the, from this area to the rest of the world. It, it includes Mersin and Adana and Tarsus. These are the villages of the apostles demonstration in Alexandria, in Alec, uh, Alexandretta against the annexion to, to Turkey. This is a identity card of people living there. They are Syrians and not Turkish. So at the end, there are four areas which were lost. Kilikia, it's an Arabic, Cilici, uh, mainly Armenian and Arab-speaking Orthodox, because Turkey were, had lots of Greek-speaking Orthodox. They're not Greeks. They're Greek-speaking, and they're Anatolians. I made a conference last year. I can make it for you in English. I made it in Arabic on the Greek genocide. They call it the Greek genocide. This is the, in red, this is Skandarun, where Antioch is. The Aintab, you, maybe you've heard of that, of these places during the, the Syrian-Turkish war. The upper Jazeera, which is the Syriac area, and Hakari, the blue, is the Assyrian area. All these places were given away and emptied of their Christian. So I finish at that period and I jump all over the independence period till, till now. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, the Arab Spring, it started with something I mean, uh, usual, normal people demonstrating in Tunisia and again against the government and willing to change it. And that in spread to six Arab countries willing for radical change and dignified living of the masses. They want dignified living. They want democracy, freedom, and improved living standard. And social media played a main role in that, which means that these are educated and young people. MENA is a very, very vulnerable area. MENA area, I mean, which includes the, the countries of the Arab Spring. It has shortages of fresh water. It's going through drought. I have research which show that MENA area is going to be, to be in serious drought in the coming decades. Desertification, extreme heat, and dust storm. The climate change was a factor of war in northern Syria and northern Iraq because they they had scarcity of food and increasing food prices, and living conditions were worsening. The agricultural situation is, was therefore very bad, no economic development in the agricultural field, and 
the situation was economically, economically questionable because they had limited water resources and eco agriculture expansion become impossible. This is, a, this, an a, this is an area which is the most water scarce in the world. Environmentally, it's an area which had lots of pollution. 90% of the solid waste in MENA countries is disposed into dump sites. In Lebanon, Lebanon is the biggest example. Air, land, and groundwater pollution from hazardous chemical is full in Lebanon. We have it a lot. Mass migration. The, uh, the I mean refugees uh, and refugees. In the last, the past decade was a decade of uh, massive uh, migration and refugee crisis. This area made more refugees than after the end of World War II. And the biggest burden of helping refugees was fallen on developing countries with weak economies like Lebanon. Lebanon has one million and a quarter or and a half Syrians, whereas the Lebanese population is four, four and a half to five million. Uh, transition. These countries cannot really make transition. I talked about that last time I met with you, the same group. These countries, they were named democracies, but they're not democracies. They're disguised clanic situation, either clans or tribes, or like in Lebanon, ethnic or religious groups. They're taking the shape of a government, but deep down, they are not governments. They are a sort of loya jerga. So there is a clash between democratization and writing, fun, rising fundamentalism because it's strong enough, the religious belonging. Uh, there is a conflict between religious and secular powers and problem, problems will prevent democratization of the Middle East, which led to military intervention. So it wasn't at all an Arab, Arab Spring, it was an Arab winter. It was the spring of Islamic fundamentalism or takfirism. Yes. So the, the estimation of, of it, the evaluation of research is that the enormous political influence of Islam in the Middle East has exceeded any historical period after the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire, which means that the, the, re the whole region is in danger. Uh, the problem is that with decolonization, after decolonization, after the, the, the Western countries left this area, it was mean, mainly led by the, by the military. We have military regimes which make the manifesto number one and they can control the regime. They control the country with the army and the weapons and they start fighting with each other. Every few years you have a sort of, of uh, coup d'etat. And if, and if a dictator stays there, he stays there for 30 or 40 years. We've seen models of that. So the, the democrat, democratic transition and democratic political life and undoubtedly constitute a major cause of the drastic changes, but it's not happening. People, you know, there is a sort of discrepancy, a sort of contradiction between what the young educated people almost with secular orientation want and what is really going on uh, in everyday life. The fundamentalism is and maybe strangling or killing totally any secular, secular orientation. Uh, the dialects of transition, they, I mean, they want elected governments. Sometimes we see that there are elections, but what kind of elections they are? It's comic elections. It's, it's really comic. Like in Lebanon, the last time they had the, this actual parliament is the product of a, of a very bad election law and they promised us it was the best law, where we saw that they manipulated the, the regions and the system in a way to have a, a certain people to access to parliament. They amended the constitution, adopted multi-party, but what, what kind of multi-party? Nobody knows. I mean, those who analyze would know, isn't it? So uh, th this, this situation intensified conflict between religious and secular forces and the de deterioration of the economy leads, leads for sure to the increase of fundamentalism and the increase of the social clashes. Uh, we saw the expand, expanding power of local and tribal forces. I mentioned it uh, a while ago and religious extremism and 
terrorism. The Western influence is there. We try to imitate the West, to, to try to make a model like the West, but we're not able to, to do it. Uh, we have some, some features of the, of the Western thinking. We have some Western cu uh, culture element integrated, I mean, in our mind, but the young generations are not able to have this applied in the political scene. One more problem is the economy. The, the economies of the Arab world and the MENA region are not liberal economies. They need liberation, liberalization. They are feudal economies. In Lebanon, once an, an economist, one professor told me, the Lebanese economy is not free. It needs to be freed. It's, it's economic. The same way we have political feudalism, we have economic feudalism. A small minority is controlling that. Once the, the Communist Party made a research, I mean, a Communist Party related organization, research organization, made a research on the, on the ruling class in Lebanon. They found that it was 400 families controlling everything in Lebanon. And even with the interreligious marriages. So when it's business, they forget uh, confessionalism. They want a more structured system of rules and better economic development, there is no freedom of action, there is no uh, entrepreneurship culture, and so on. So uh, the role of the clergy is being questioned again, not, not in the Christian, within the Christian. The Christians have such questions, but it's mainly within the Islamic uh, countries. Uh, at the same time, these, these population are witnessing a population growth just because of uh, the importation of medical techniques and of uh, nutrition techniques and medical care techniques and so on. So we're having an increase in population and we don't have a economic growth which may, which may uh, frame this increase of population, which may go, go in parallel to it. Therefore, we're going to, towards becoming more and more poor. So this is a lame transition. It's a lame transition. It's impacted in significantly and even in tragic ways by the transition movements. The faded transition, we have a failed transition to adopt modern forms of government lead to the accumulation of persisting problems and an increase in fundamental activity. Everything goes to the fundamentalism at the end because, because the nationalist regimes of the 60s and the 70s failed. They are replaced in the Arab world by the Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, all sorts of problems emerge, sociopolitical divisions, uh, social, all social structures, tribes and clans and so on. Poverty, unemployment, violence and so on. Poverty, this is a very poor area. 41% uh, of, of the population is poor. Uh, there is extreme poverty in the MENA area. MENA, it means Arab world. I mean, we shouldn't go very, very far. I mean, and uh, the, the poverty in MENA between 2011 and 2015 has doubled. And it, the, the, this is the, 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 the peak. A poor family in the Middle East today will remain poor for several generations. This is according to Carnegie. Business unemployment, youth unemployment is very high. Youth are, are leaving the country because they're searching for better life abroad, at least a decent employment. It keeps increasing. There is no creation of enough jobs. If we have to, to accommodate every youth which becoming part of the jo job market, we have to create between 60 and 100,000 million, 100 million jobs but with the coming, within the coming eight years, which we don't have. We don't have not even 10% of that. And now with the actual situation with the corona and the, in the Arab world and the economic crisis in Lebanon, we have a closure of businesses intensively. The security situation is very volatile. And we have not only local criminals and local terrorists, but we have proxies affiliated with regional and international competing powers. They do it inside to the account of the outside. Uh, the spread of the pandemic in Syria and Iraq may, there is an estimation that it may uh, help for a ISIS resurgence. And the spread of poverty uh, is a driving force behind the recruitment of fundamentalist entities. Situation and role of Christians. 
the churches are not spared by the transition process that is taking place in the region. Life became more difficult for Christians. It's seen as a community or as a group of communities which has close ties with the West. It was an easy target to militias. Churches, convents, schools, institutions were looted and sometimes destroyed. We're repairing them now. Armenian in Karabakh, they had problems. We remember the few months ago war in Nagorno-Karabakh. It took, it took a religious turn. The violence that ensued was then religionized and the politicization of religion led to the religionization of the conflict. The Syriac in Anatolia and Turkey, I don't like to, talk it, to, to, to call it Turkey. Syriac or Syrianis has faced many difficulties and various forms of oppression and discrimination for illegal acquisition of, this, of land by the state. There are two also local violence. The state officials attempt to intimidate and close down ancient Christian monasteries. In 2011, the, the U.S. House of Representatives adopted a religious freedom measure calling upon Turkey to return the Christian church properties installed through genocide and to end its repression of the surviving. The quantity, the, 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 the volume of land belonging to the churches there and to the Christians who fled and who live in my area, I'm from an area in Ash uh, where my 80% of my parish are from, from uh, Antioch, are from Alexandria, Alexandretta, and from the northern Syria. They have huge spaces of land, the same as the Palestinians. The Syriacs too, the Syriac uh, cultural heritage will, will disappear. It's in danger, not like the Armenian, because the Armenian have their country, their government. So they're being uprooted. The southeast of Turkey is almost totally empty. Nothing is remaining, very, very few number, very few people, very little numbers. Uh, in the last years, the violations against Christians in Turkey have increased significantly. In Egypt, Egypt, you know, it's very, very contradictory. On one side, you see that the government tries to protect Christians where, uh, at, at the political level, whereas you see that some uh, government officials persecute Christians. So the church is very active there. They're in very good terms with the government. The problems are mainly in the rural areas where there is uh, illiteracy, there is uh, poverty and uh, backwardness, uh, but uh, it's, it's being a, a burden. The, the Christians in Egypt, uh, in some areas they live well, in some other Asia areas they have uh, deep problems, real problems. Uh, Christians in, sorry. I lost this word. No, I, ah, Christian in uh, Palestine. In Palestine, the occupation, you know what the occupation is doing. Sometimes they say that they bought the land, there is no legal papers. I talked a few years ago to the Petra of Jerusalem. They're, they're making, they're forging papers. They're not correct. I suggested that he puts everything on the internet to show everybody that the church there is not selling land, but they're confiscating. All the government, supposedly of the, the, the occupation government, uh, public institutions are on the Orthodox church land. And the Christians there are only 1% of the population. This is statistics I got from my colleague, uh, uh, the head of the, the SPR, Dr. Uh, Bernard or Epifan Sabella. He, he, may, he wrote a long study about it. You see that the Christian population to the total population is 5.4, 0 0.4, 12 in Ramallah and Biri, 2 in Jerusalem, 11 at Bethlehem, and 0 0.6 and 0 0 0.06. So it's very, very... Uh, thin figures, thin, thin presence in the Palestinian land. In Lebanon, Christian make 36% of the, of the Christians of the population today. When the Lebanese uh, government was created, it was 65% and any other figure, you may read it is wrong because I have the official figures. 
in Syria, they were 10% before the war in Syria. Now they went down a little, but the good thing is that they're protected in their areas and the government is very good about them. In Iraq is the big, the big bleeding of population. They went from one and a half, almost million to 300,000 maximum. In Palestine, I just told, gave you the, the figures. If you see statistics on Christians in the Middle East, in 1882, they were 25%. I had it from a source, but I'm not sure of it. Last, in the last century, I mean, in the 19th century, Christians there were almost a little than the half of the people of the Fertile Crescent, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. In 1914, it's a, I mean, these are figures I'm not sure of, but I found them in a source. Uh, I, I'll mention the sources at the end, you know. But today, by country, this is uh, somehow correct. Lebanon, 1.5 million. Syria, 1 million or a little less. Jordan, the figure is not good. Israel, I mean, Palestine, uh, this is the figure. Gaza, Egypt, 8 million. 8 million is not correct. I mean, there are at least 22 million cops in, in Egypt. Uh, do Christian have... Uh, we stay or leave the area, the answer is not optimistic, to say, at, at, to say the least. Even before ISIS, Middle Eastern Christianity was in decline, and this is true across the whole region. Uh, the despotism, the unachieved modernity uh, in the Near Eastern societies, all this is pushing Christians to leave the area. Christians can live only in a secular country. Even if they are a majority, they prefer to live in a secular country. You know, segregation is not good for Christians. They won't accept it because their ideology, their, their, their faith, their values don't accept it. Commun communitarism appears to be the sole source of safety. Actually, people get a refuge in their community, in the religious community, but this is not the good measure to do it. Uh, Christian communities are being eroded in the area gradually. And we are losing. Now, the reversing the trend, I'll be, talk, I'll be talking about it in a, in, a, in a while, may require a new secular democratic liberal politics across the Levant, a Latin population, popular political will toward this more inclusive approach still persists. There are lots of Muslims and Christians who want to have this area secular, but the religiously linked forces, political forces, are not accepting that. Sadly, the political leadership that would summon the courage to embrace it, it has yet to emerge. I think some emerged and they were killed and uh, uh, exterminated by the, by the governments. So it needs a rigorous intervention. Otherwise, the Levant will lose its identity. It's a mosaic. It's a very beautiful cultural, religious, and ethnic mosaic. The Levant will be different of what it used to, to be. Uh, every Christian leaving here, they say it's 2,000 years of history. I say it's 6,000 years of history because we, were not, we did not come to this country with Christianity. We were here much before Christianity. We're living in this country for thousands of years. And when you see the remnants and you make some archaeological digging, you see how old history is in this, in this country. One of my sons told me they wanted to, to, to emigrate and asked me if I wanted to go. I told them, no, I'm, my roots are 6,000 years deep. I will, I'm not able to, to uproot them. The way forward, how to reverse the process. A process should be reversed. This is a big challenge. The main, if you ask me about the challenges, there is one challenge, there is a process that, that should be reversed. It should not be a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Christians will end, the Christians will leave. No, it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can do it otherwise. The will to stay, it needs to have resilience with the sense of belonging. They have to see their fingerprints on every civilization in this area, from North Africa till the confines of China. It's not, it's not nostalgia, it's collective self-consciousness. This is a, a painting of the Christians in Iraq, the Syriac and the Suryanis. We don't want to see this anymore. It shouldn't be anymore. It should end. 
and all this feeling of minority should end. This is this this is a disease. This is a, 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 a psychotic situation. We have to develop a historical consciousness, consciousness of our presence, who we are, our identity, our legacy, our contribution to the civilization. How come all the cities in this area carry Syriac, all Syriac names? How come all the languages here have all Syriac roots? If you hear the Arab, the, the, the Iraqi Arab, the Iraqi Arab is, is Assyrian, Assyrian uh, music, song uh, it's spoken in arabic uh, letters it's there we have to reinforce the social capital between christians and the sense of human dignity human dignity i mean everybody knows what is it but nobody tries to implement it we're trying to implement it if you see that what i'm presenting is close to the mecc program this is correct because the mecc program was built with the perspective of the emergency and the most crucial issues to be done, matters to be done for the Christians to remain in that, in that area. <sighs> Youth activities, they should be able to put the cross very high and to be proud of their belonging, of their Christianity and with, the, so, with their solidarity and with their vision. They will prepare tomorrow. We have to develop the institutions of the churches. We're already doing it. I mean, our colleagues in Syria and Lebanon are doing it reconstruct the damaged ones, modernization of equipment, development of programs. Working on the demographic issue is very element. Reprise demographic in French. We have to resume demographic growth. And we can do it only if we help families to be created, to help couples to create families. They can help families by occupational development, agricultural education, and medical. Churches own schools, they own hospitals, they own land. If the people leave, it means that they're not managing properly their resources or they're not caring, which is not the case, no. One main tendency which should be developed is the ruralization of the churches is an urgent and necessity issue, a necessary issue. We have to ruralize the churches to create rural agglomeration and the church land and to develop agricultural programs there. This will help also the, the development of ecology. Uh, they should coordinate their efforts. They, they should be in solidarity. If they're not all together, they will perish one by one. There should be a system very well intermingled, very well tied to each other, unbreakable system, which includes subsystems. If the Christianity is a system, the subsystems are their services, their activities, and their structures, and all should coordinate together. We have some experience of that in, in the MECC, we have in Lebanon, in Syria. So we have to, to perpetuate it everywhere in the Middle East. They have to systematize their presence, work, and coordination. It shouldn't be, you know, if I can do it, I try. No, it should be systematic because they have institutions. They have the best institutions in the Levant area. Either we are a bundle entity like the bunch of sticks. This is a Kenyan proverb. Sticks in a bundle are unbreakable. Or we will be broken stick by stick. The choice is ours. Christians should, could be a bunch or could be a bunch of bunches. It depends. Every, Christian, every church could be a bunch and all of them could be a bunch of bunches. Why not? They, they should be in togetherness. And all this is, can be translated into institutional action, into, into systematic uh, programs. MECC is one main catalyst in all that, and it will help. MECC is trying to do all the best. My colleagues before me try to do all the best. I'm trying to do all the best. I can do it, but we, it depends also on the cooperation of the churches. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your Patience, I wish I wasn't too long. No, oh, I was too long. No, not too long. No, not at all. Dr. Ops, thank I you went, so much. I, I, I appreciate it. You know, every, every slide is a story by itself. So I. Thank you so much for your clear you. and sharp analysis of the historical and current realities in the region and for linking them to the 
uh, the, the situation of Christians in the region and the role of the Middle East Council of Churches in that, uh, in articulating some of your priorities uh, and directions for the council. Uh, so that's very useful for us. Um, as Becca indicated in the chat, uh, we will be making this presentation available uh, to all of the attendees. So you'll have an opportunity to see the, uh, the slides that Dr. Ops presented and study those uh, more deeply. So we're grateful that you're willing to share those with us, Dr. Ops. Uh, if you have questions, I would ask you to put them in the question and answer box in chat. And we do have a few uh, that, uh, that are coming in already. Um, and if we don't have time for all of them, we will, we will uh, ask those of, of Dr. Ops and follow up uh, for you. So yes. thank you. Um, one thing first, is that I, I'll send you tomorrow all the slides, the whole presentation, but I need to add the, uh, the references. I didn't want to, to put them today. So you, everybody will, has, will have the document. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I, the, the first question uh, that came in has to do with Christian Zionism, and this is an area that the MECC has worked on uh, in the past. Uh, yes. how, how do you counsel Christians outside of the Middle East to confront the theology of Christian Zionism, which tends to ignore the reality of the Christian community in the region and instead focuses on support for Israel? Yes, very good question. Um, well, Christian Zionism is, is a big issue. I have dealt with it ever since I was Lebanon director in the 1980s. We had, a, we had them installed in southern Lebanon, when, where, which was occupied by the Zionist state in Palestine. And I had a fight with the, with the pastor there and with the several people of the institutions. This is something which needs to be done on the awareness level, on the communication level. Anyway, happily, we have now a, a fully, almost fully appointed uh, theological and ecumenical committee for the department. They will start on such programs, and we have almost appointed or found the, the, the adequate candidate for this department to go with it. But definitely, it's a matter of advocacy. It's a matter of communication and the public education. And we, we can do whatever we want, but you know that this tendency is strong, and they're using mainly the Old Testament. I was very happy listening to you talking about the gospel. I want to hear about the gospel. I don't want to hear about the Bible, I mean the Old Testament. Uh, to, uh, every day I have a fight with somebody about this. You want to read it, read it. But my book is the gospel. And my, my, my God is Christ, is not Abraham. They want to Abrahamize everything now. Uh, and this is part of the whole process. I mean, this is a conspiracy. This is a real conspiracy against Christianity. Thank you. I've just put in the chat a resource uh, on our website on Christian Zionism, which includes the MECC's booklet, which it produced a few years ago on Christian Zionism. Ah, great. Yes. The next uh, question refers to a, a comment you made in your presentation. What does fundamentalism promise people that accounts for its increasing influence? Or is it simply fear of physical injury and death? No, fundamentalism tells people you don't have to care for this earth here. You can live in any way. You can live in poor, uh, in, in poverty, in, in sickness. The promise is in the, in the Odola, in the, in the, in behind, the, behind the skies where you go and you see the prophet and you see God and you get women and you get uh, milk and you get honey and so on and so forth. This is the, this is the problem. They promise them, they give promises which they, they cannot, I mean, nobody can control. And uh, they, because they cannot give uh, earthy promises for people. Thank you. There are several questions related to the, uh, the situation in Israel and Palestine. Uh, so I'll try to, uh, to bundle them or bunch them together to use your metaphor. Um, and uh, so one is in the chat, how can cr Palestinian Christians in the US help the churches in Palestine? Uh, the second relates to uh, advocacy in the U.S. Uh, with, with uh, members of Congress who are progressive in every area except Palestine. Uh, what can we do and what would you charge us to do in the U.S. Uh, to reach uh, those representatives and to help them to understand the issues uh, that Palestinian Christians and Palestinians generally uh, are facing? And then there are some others, but we'll come to those. Uh, I'll give you a chance to, to yes, respond yes. to those. 
But well, with, with our Christian values, we cannot do to them what the Zionism do for them. We cannot catch them in bad situations and uh, take pictures of them and, and blackmail them later on if they don't uh, obey to what we say. They will have a, a public uh, a scandal. We cannot blackmail them on other dimensions. This is the way they're doing things and, I, and everybody knows how they go about it. We are not, we, what we can do is to convince them and to tell them that we love them despite everything that we love them. We really, really love them. Sometimes I pity them. Sometimes even, even towards the Jews in Palestine who, are, who occupy a land which is not ours at all, at all. It's just a, a, a big joke. It's a big, big, big heresy, political and religious heresy. I love them and I pity them because they're being manipulated to serve a big international armed ammunition cartel, which is managing the whole world. Mm. And that's it. The Jews in Palestine are in the same in this in this uh, hell. That is uh, consistent with one of the, 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 the questions that came in, uh, which speaks about uh, the role of the U.S. and the U.S. government, which uh, which spends almost four billion dollars a year in military aid uh, to Israel, three point eight billion dollars each year. Uh, so people are very eager uh, to engage, and we'll put some links in the chat in ways that you can um, you can participate and uh, and advocate, particularly on this issue. Uh, another question came in uh, linking uh, the question about uh, the role of Hamas. Uh, in this conflict, and also the Middle East Council of Churches uh, and its role in seeking programs of peace in Palestine. And we will put the Middle East Council of Churches statement uh, on the current crisis in the chat in a moment. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, let, let me go back to the American government and American spending on, on ammunitions. I, I, know, I know very well the American people. And once I met a senator, so I, I put to him a maybe a naive question, naive apparently question. How could, how could a, a noble and nice people like the Americans have such criminal governments? I really, I really don't have an answer for that as a sociologist because their main aim is to spend money on arms and ammunitions and to make wars everywhere and to, to develop these, these, these corporations, that they become wider and bigger and stronger and so on. They don't have to do it, but they're under the yoke of the, this cartel, which chose some previously, some presidents of the Republic of America. And everybody knows that. I don't want to name names or to go into the detailed politics of America, but this is the way things are done. I mean, once, once, once somebody told me uh, about a president that he, an American, he never won a war. I told him he doesn't want, want to win a war. He, he wants just to make war. So the, the, the factories will continue. I mean, whoever wrote the book of uh, Raymond Aron, La Société Industrielle et la Guerre, knows how it functions. This is the way it functions. The machine has to continue producing and consuming equipment, and people, and lives, and houses, and everything. Now, for uh, for Hamas, and well, I, yes. I, I didn't I didn't deal with that at all. I mean, I, I will not go into the deep politics of Palestine, but we we expressed our general uh, ongoing, uh, I mean, everlasting attitude about that in our communique last week, uh, the week before, maybe. And, and this that, is all we can do. The, the SPR program is doing its work. They're doing their job. They're helping, you know. We, we, are, we are a small size compared to these huge, I mean. I mean, if they send a bomb, which is, let's say, $100,000, I mean, $100,000 can help us work for one year in, in a special, specific field. <laughs> Becca is laughing. <laughs> she likes it. Yes. I, well, I tell them all the time, look, if you want to buy a car of $20,000, you will look in the market for three months. If you want to send a rocket for hundred thousand dollars, you send it in one second. This is where the war is is, is very. I mean, is a is a the is a is a uh, expenditure uh, activity, is expenditure uh, action, and where you can spend lots of money and make lots of of profits to these companies. 
this is where I see the, the cartel of the oil, arms, and ammunition. And just for the information of our listeners, uh, the DSPR is the Department of Service for Palestinian Refugees, which is a program of the Middle East Council of Churches and has been in existence uh, longer than the MECC itself. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, ecumenical witness uh, to the role of the churches in response to this ongoing tragedy. Yes. Uh, there are several links in the side. Uh, one is an action alert that you can use on US military funding to Israel. We've also put the Middle East Council of Churches statement on the current situation in Israel-Palestine on the, in the chat, and the, uh, the UCC and disciple statement as well. Yeah. Um, I want to criticize one element, please, Dr. Makari. What yes, I'm please. talking may sound like communists. Everybody who listens to me should know that I'm not a communist. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, my PhD thesis is about entrepreneurship, and I am for a free enterprise and free economy and, and freedom and everything. But we have to name things by their names. Sorry, thank you. We're grateful for your honesty. I have one final okay. question, if you would uh, indulge us, and this is a, may perhaps a big one. Uh, what role has the West played in emptying the Middle East and North Africa of its Christian community? And you've already started to answer that in your presentation. Oh. Ever since the Crusades, when the Crusades came to Constantinople and they hit it, hit it, hit it hard, then Muhammad al-Fatih came a few months later and he took Constantinople. And when he took Constantinople, he took the whole area. And during the overall, the whole history of the East, the, the West Christianity is being bad, is not the word bad, is being, has a wrongdoings for the Eastern Christianity. Uh, missionaries did very good things. I mean, the, the Catholics missionaries and the Protestant missionaries who created the AUB at Lebanon, the American University of Beirut and my university, University Saint Joseph, the French and the American did very good deeds for the country. This is something different. But I mean, but I mean, the the politics of the West, which used the religion for the, to justify their actions, did a very wrong, very bad things to the to these countries. Well, I think that also helps to answer another question that came in about Christian Zionism and its use as a tool. Uh, but we don't have uh, time to continue as much as we would like to. Uh, this has been a very engaging opportunity, and we're grateful to you, Dr. Abs, for your leadership of the council and also for your clear uh, analysis and presentation today. Um, we're grateful for all of the participants who have joined, uh, and uh, we'll follow up with the participants with the slides and the and the links uh, that uh, that are included. So thank you very much once again, Dr. Abs, for uh, for being with us today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. I'm, I may give one one last uh, clarification. Since the day I started my mandate, we had a visit with uh, a, a meeting with the Reverend El Marie Parker, and one main issue was the discussion of the Christian Zionism, and we agreed to to fight it together. So it's on the agenda, but we didn't prepare all what should, should be done. So thank you for, for everybody for, for listening, for answering. You can send me uh, questions whenever you want. Uh, I'll give you my email. I'll be able to respond orally via, via Zoom or in written because there are lots of details to be dealt with in this presentation. But you I just... promised uh, Dr. Makari and Becca to send it tomorrow. You have given us a, a very uh, profound and, uh, and fascinating, stimulating um, entranceway uh, to all of those conversations. So thank you. Thank um, you. We would like to uh, close in prayer and Becca, I'm going to turn it over to Becca for some final uh, instructions and then to offer us a closing prayer. Great, thank you so much, Peter and Dr. Abs for being with us today. Uh, we appreciate you all for joining us. Um, this webinar was uh, live streamed onto YouTube. So we're, we're already up on YouTube. We'll put the resources that we've shared in the Zoom chat will also be in the, the YouTube description and we'll send them out through email to everyone who's registered. So keep an eye on your email for that. I saw some questions come through about 
um, how we can support the, the church's work there. So not only can you lift up the voices of our partners through, um, we have our, uh, globalministries.org, we, we post statements and resources and prayers and other worship materials uh, from our partners in the Middle East and around the world. So please, I encourage you to use those in your local churches and in some of your advocacy efforts. Um, you can also support the work of the Middle East Council of Churches through um, donations. And I've put a bunch of uh, variety of ways in which you can do that uh, in the chat. Um, we encourage you to um, give what, what money you can to support this work. Um, and so with that, uh, we have a couple of upcoming webinars in this Wednesdays with the World series. So on June 2nd at 2 p.m. Eastern, we'll have a webinar called Testing Justice, the Divide of COVID-19 Access Globally. And then on June 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, um, we'll have a webinar called Together and Hope, a Journey Through Southern Asia. So we hope that you join us for those two upcoming webinars. Um, and uh, let us close in prayer. This prayer has come from the uh, Episcopal Archbishop of Jerusalem. So please join with me in prayer. Yes. Almighty yes. and everlasting God, our days are in your hands. We lift up all those in the Holy Land who are victims of violence and injustice, that you might empower your church to bring healing to the wounded, relief to the suffering, and comfort to those who mourn. We pray also that you would soften the hearts of all those involved in the recent conflicts, that they would be led to work for justice and lasting peace in the land where your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, first came to bring hope and abundant life to all people. These things we ask in his holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Siblings in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed as you continue your day. Know that you are not alone, and we are holding you in prayer. Amen. <laughs>